Welcome to what is set to be a fabulous and fascinating 90 minutes on a topic that is fast becoming a major diplomatic global discussion, the recognition of ecocide in international law. Today's event is the first contribution to the activities of an Ocean for Ecocide Law Network, which will have its official launch on World Ocean Day this summer. First, a little housekeeping. We have a wonderful range of speakers to fit into the time that we have. And so rather than a live Q&A at the end, we anticipate some panel reflections while the team will be responding to Q&A via our keyboards. We therefore warmly invite questions to be put via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, where these can be clearly replied to, and also feel free to upvote questions so we can address them in priority order. Please do not use the chat for functions, but do say hello and say where you are tuning in from. Our speakers are beaming in from the globe, from all around the globe, and we imagine our audiences too. So, let me begin by introducing myself as I'll be moderating today's event for you. I'm Caroline Mayer Toby. Um, I am the Chief Empowerment Officer for She Changes Climate. I am also the founding director for Institute for Small Islands. And I'm a lawyer with Mayor and Company in Legal Response International who has been advising small islands and developing countries um, for about 10 years. Hello, Antoinette, I just saw your face there. For about 10 years at the UNFCCC negotiations. So why is eco -law, eco side law exciting for you? I think that it's time to take the situation into our own hands. I think that we can't rely on big businesses and big governments anymore. And I think it's time for us, the people of the earth, to stand up and say what is right for us. This is an extraordinarily exciting time, and I'm so glad to be here for it. Without further ado, I'd like to give the word to our state co-host, the Republic of Vanuatu, to open the event. His Excellency Bakua Kaltonaga, Kaltonga, Ministerial Special Envoy on Climate Change, Republic of Vanuatu, will be speaking today on behalf of the Honorable Minister of Climate Change, Ralph Reginav, Regin Vanu. The Honorable Minister is currently located on one of the outer islands of Vanuatu, which has been just been hit by a, cat, a devastating Category 4 cyclone as I'm sure you will understand, was unable to join us today. And let's just take a moment and remember, this is why we're here. This is why we're here. Welcome, Your Excellency. My name is Bakawa Kaltan, and I am the uh, Minister of Special Envoy uh, for Climate Change of the Government of the Republic of Vanuatu. Uh, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the Honorable Ralph Ravon, the Minister of Climate Change who apparently is stuck in one of the outer islands of Vanuatu after uh, the uh, destruction uh, uh, winds of cyclone, uh, uh, Category 4 cyclone of uh, Judy. Uh, and we hope uh, he is uh, fine and we pray for his safety. Uh, and the communications are down. And uh, there's another Category cyclone following the same path after all the destruction that has been caused. Uh, in the next 48 hours. So there's no more important time to speak about oceans and climate change than now for the Republic of Vanuatu. So you will appreciate the, uh, uh, the damage that's been caused by the cyclones, and that, that's including the coral reefs, uh, who have been uh, decimated, bleached, uh, the seagrass and the mangroves destroyed, and uh, a number of uh, you know marine habitats destroyed. Uh, and the food, food, the deprivation of food, and the destruction of food. And uh, as you can see, it's a major humanitarian disaster for us. So there is no better time to speak about uh, the oceans and its disruptions and, and the climate change. Uh, 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 than now, when, when, when we were experiencing it firsthand and, and facing the problems ourselves. And uh, uh, this is the time for people to act, and Vanuatu is taking the lead uh, to criminalize the sorts of uh, irresponsible actions that are destroying the climate change and the oceans. 
and uh, we need to all to join in the effort to fight uh, fight the, the, the injustice that uh, is being uh, done by people who are harming the, the, the environment and the oceans. So Vanuatu is leading the way in the International Criminal Court of Justice by uh, putting together a resolution to ask the question on states' uh, obligations as to uh, climate change. And uh, we have uh, put forward a, a resolution to the uh, New Union, United Nations General Assembly, which I am glad to announce that uh, 105 countries have co-sponsored, which would enable the resolution to be passed in the UNJ on for the opportunity for Vanuatu and uh, the other global nations of the world to put the question to the International Court of Justice to obtain a decision so as to enable states uh, to honor their obligations on the amount of contributions they make to the climate change crisis. So what started in the, uh, the, in, in the Pacific classrooms has now become a, a global issue where uh, we would like everybody to join Vanuatu in fighting these sorts of issues, in upholding the rule of law, uh, to ensure that people and countries are held accountable for the actions uh, on, on the evil side and, and, and uh, to ensure that uh, they are held uh, responsible under international law on, uh, on the uh, equal side crimes that affect the human rights around the world and to ensure that we have uh, set up the proper framework and the legal frameworks to govern and legislate against these sorts of activities. And uh, this is the only way for us to countries who have suffered from the climate change crisis, who have contributed to less, uh, we will need to act on a global scale to ensure they protect the communities, the environment, and their life in which, and, and humanity in general, per se, for, for everybody. So there is no time to waste. Join Vanuatu in its fight for ecocide and fight for climate justice to ensure a better environment, a better world for us to live in. Thank you very much. God bless you. That is just wonderful. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And, and I mean, it's really, really on. It's, it's amazing. 105 states yesterday co-sponsored a resolution in the UN General Assembly, virtually guaranteeing its referral to the ICJ. So I just want to take a moment to congratulate Vanuatu, the Pacific Islands fighting climate change, the Pacific Islands students climate, fighting climate change, and to everyone involved in what is really just a phenomenal diplomatic effort. So let us continue. My apologies. Um, right. So Vanuatu is really leading at a global level on climate crisis and driving this conversation. Vanuatu ministers, ambassadors, and other diplomats have regularly co-hosted events with the Stop Ecocide Foundation in many high-level contexts. From the COP talks at Sharm el Sheikh in Montreal to the meetings with the financiers in Davos. There's a growing number of states joining this conversation. We are privileged today to have a second ministerial in intervention, this time from the Republic of Finland, where the political discussion of ecocide law is beginning to take place. Climate, Environment and Climate Change Minister Maria Ohisalo has been kind enough to send us her own video message in support of today's event. Dear participants and friends of our planet, from mountains to lowlands, from forests to ocean floors, we are experiencing a mass destruction of the natural living world. It has a huge impact on ecosystems and the economy. The key topic of this event, the oceans, is an important one. Finland is a maritime country with a long coastline towards the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is especially fragile because it is relatively shallow. 
Last year, we saw an attack on the Nord Stream pipeline that severely impacted maritime life near the Danish island of Bornholm. Of course, the sabotage was a crime in itself, but it was also an act of ecocide. Oceans are vulnerable also on the global level. Good examples of ecocide are the effects of seabed mining. We do need minerals for green transition and new batteries, but they shouldn't be acquired in a way that lays havoc on nature. The destruction of nature is no longer a local or national problem. Ecosystems do not acknowledge borders and nature has no nationality. That is why ecocide should be an international crime. As a step towards global responsibility of our common nature, I am happy to announce that Finland will be co-sponsoring Vanuatu's initiative to request for an opinion of the International Court of Justice on the obligations of states in respect of climate change. Thank you, Stop Ecocide International, for your important work. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just wonderful. And from my maritime country, my island of Trinidad Tobago, I thank you for your leadership. That is just wonderful. So that was the Environment and Climate Change Minister of the Republic of Finland, Maria Osalo. So thank you very much, Minister. Now, our first panelist for today will give us the broad background and the rationale behind I'm going to continue like you can hear me, but I've frozen on my end. So let me know if you can't hear me. Right. Um, now, our first panelist today will give us the broad background and rationale. Wonderful. Behind fast growing initiative to criminalize ecocide and provide a sense of the current state of play. Jojo Meta co-founded Stop Ecocide in 2017 alongside legal pioneer the late Polly Higgins, to support making severe harm to nature and international crime. I apologize if you can hear my children behind me. As key spokesperson and executive director of Stop Ecocide International, Jojo has overseen the remarkable growth of the global movement while coordinating legal developments, diplomatic traction, and public narrative. She is also chair of the charitable Stop Ecocide Foundation, co-hosting today, and convener of the independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide, chaired by Philip Sands QC and Dior Falls. So, Jojo, tell us, first of all, welcome. What is ecocide? Why is it so important to know about the approach of this law? And what can we expect over the course of the coming year? Over to you, Jojo. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you. It's an honor to be in such amazing company for this event. Um, and such a, a a kind of double you know a, a, a tragic reminder of why we're doing this from the cyclone in Vanuatu and also a triumph from Vanuatu's um putting forward of the ICJ request to the UN so yeah really an incredibly exciting moment um and this is the first uh, event in the context of a new global network ocean for ecocide law and the intention of bringing such a network into being is as the name implies to actively gather support within the wider ocean community for a law that has huge potential to protect the ocean by preventing and deterring the worst harms to marine ecosystems and species. And gathering this support across governments and many sectors of civil society is what we do at Stop Ecocide International to actively progress the recognition of ecocide, which is to say severe and either widespread or long-term damage to nature as an international crime. The ocean is home to myriad ecosystems, from coastal mangroves to the complex interactions of the biggest and tiniest keystone species in the deep sea. And the ocean is also the planet's primary regulator of climate. So she's our greatest provider of life and livelihoods, and we have not been treating her well. From brutal fishing practices to prospecting for minerals on the sea floor, as the minister mentioned, we are either threatening or already creating irreparable damage when we could be coexisting in harmony with the most extraordinary creatures on the earth and benefiting indefinitely from the planet-wide natural currents and life-giving breathing cycles of the ocean. So what is missing to shift that balance? Economic competitiveness often trumps best practice and precaution, 
and countries and companies desperate for income are perhaps unsurprisingly tempted to turn a blind eye to potential destruction in the light of the perceived needs of the immediate present. The fact that this attitude arises all too frequently signals maybe not so much a class of supervillains as a simple truth that we all know in our hearts, that the globally dominant culture of extraction without thought to the consequences, of treating the living world simultaneously as an infinite bank of resources and a planet-sized trash can, it has reproduced itself to a point that is critically unsustainable. We all know you can't build your business model on killing people. It would be criminal and criminally insane, but we simply don't take the earth herself seriously enough to recoil in the same way, the same healthy way from destroying and polluting her. So what's missing to create that crucial steer? We know that multilateral agreements and pledges, while important in the specifics, have not been able to effectively put the brakes on destruction or create the pace of change and shift of attitude needed. And this is where criminal law, and specifically the recognition of ecocide at the international level, can make a profound difference by drawing a moral and legal red line that extends beyond and across jurisdictional boundaries. The true function of criminal law is protective. Murder isn't a crime in order to punish murderers, it's a crime in order to stop people being killed. In other words, to protect. There is a far greater incentive to adhere to regulations, quotas, and the precautionary principle, far greater incentive to engage in the right kind of due diligence and indeed to explore strategic positive change when failing to do so could lead into the territory of international crime. And while ecocide law is still a relatively new concept in the public mind, it is already an initiative that is gathering rapid momentum at the diplomatic level. In 2019, no governments were known to be talking about it and Vanuatu spoke out first at the International Criminal Court. Now, at least 26 countries have discussion of criminalizing equal ecocide on public record, at parliament level or government level, via government statements, parliamentary petitions, full proposals of law and law. In November 2020, our foundation convened a panel of 12 top lawyers from around the world to spend six months drafting a legal definition of ecocide. And the core text they reached consensus on in June 2021 was the following. Ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. This definition doesn't specifically target any particular industry. Instead, it addresses the level of harm or hazard, whatever the activity, and it applies to individuals in positions of superior responsibility, creating a clear steer at the highest levels of government and industry exactly where it's most useful. It acknowledges that a large proportion of destructive practices are already unlawful, breaches of regulation, breaches of rights frameworks, and so on, or that they are wantonly, disproportionately destructive. And this definition has landed well in the political world as it sanctions the threats of the worst harms while acknowledging and strengthening existing laws, which may vary between jurisdictions. And while drawing directly on legal language familiar from previous international treaties, it is also clearly understandable to you and me. And it fits on the back of a business card, which is frankly handy when you're dealing with busy politicians. Indeed, in the 18 months since its launch, this consensus definition has become the de facto starting point for diplomatic and academic discussions worldwide. It's also inspired domestic proposals, most prominently in Belgium, where the government is in the process of legislating nationally. And last year, the conversation arrived at the UN level too. Our foundation was invited to host side events and run pavilions at a number of UN conferences, including the Climate COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh, Biodiversity COP15 in Montreal, and alongside the economic meetings in Davos. There is already a small group of states informally working together to progress discussion of adding ecocide to the list of crimes addressed at the International Criminal Court, and it's being led by our long-standing ally and the co-host today, the Republic of Vanuatu. And there is another advantage to this concise definition. In the hands of anyone who knows their own sector, it stimulates questions. It provides a lens through which people can look to ask, what does my sector need to do in the light of this approaching law? And these are precisely the questions that need to be asked to stimulate positive change. So there is a readiness, indeed an appetite, both for creating accountability at the highest level and for framing what we need to change. 
And over the course of this year, we're going to see a growing momentum, both in at the diplomatic level and at the level of different sectors of society. And the Ocean for Ecocide Law Network can be a key part of that. We very much hope you'll join us. Thank you so much and really looking forward to the rest of today's discussion. Thank you so much, Jojo. We can no doubt already begin to see why ocean protection could be significantly strengthened with this law. Oh, but apologies for that. Let's get into the substance of what we're dealing with. The reality of what is happening to marine life, what is being done to address it, and the kinds of contexts where ecocide, where recognition of ecocide can make a difference. Our next speaker, Sebastian Losada, is the Ocean's Policy Advisor at Greenpeace International and the Secretary of the Deep Sea, Conserva Deep sea Conservation Coalition. Greenpeace's history of direct action and campaigning is strongly bound up with issues of ocean protection and the conservation of marine species. And Greenpeace International is, coordinating, is its coordinating body. Meanwhile, the DSCC organized, coordinates a network of over 100 ocean-focused NGOs fisher organizations, and law and policy institutes worldwide. So concentrating on reducing the greatest threats to life in the deep sea and safeguarding the long-term health and integrity and resilience of the deep sea ecosystems. Sebastian has combined his work in political fora with several at sea expeditions to document deep sea fisheries and the impacts of Im illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Sebastian is also focused on the impact of industrial fishing practices on coastal communities and the roles of fisheries and aquaculture on food security. Sebastian, you've been working at the global heart of ocean conservation week as well as on the front lines, and we're eager to hear your perspective on this and your, on your initial thoughts on how ecocide law has the potential to support the work of these diverse and committed organizations. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Caroline, and hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank, let me thank Ecoside International for inviting Greenpeace to speak at this event at this crucial time. Uh, also, let me say that I, I am not an expert on Ecoside, but I'm going to try to put some examples of how the current uh, legal framework is failing uh, in preventing harm to marine ecosystems. To also provide some context, um, let me say that right as we speak, governments are finalizing negotiations in New York um, at the United Nations headquarters of a new treaty, an oceans treaty, to protect marine biodiversity on the high seas. The high seas make up about half of the planet and over 60% of the global ocean surface. So this is of course a milestone for all of us working on marine biodiversity and conservation. One of the things I've been following with interest during the negotiations of this treaty is the response of some existing industries and sectoral bodies. So industries and sectors which, in a way, fear losing some of the influence and power that they currently hold with the adoption of the new ocean treaty. Let's look at fishing, for instance. It's widely known that large-scale industrial fishing is one of the main drivers of biodiversity loss in the oceans. Yet a submission made to treaty negotiations by probably the largest fishing industry association, the International Coalition of Fisheries Associations, stated last week that, I quote, no regulatory gaps have been identified for fisheries. And well, as we know, this is not the case. In its submission, the fisheries association subsequently demanded the exclusion of fisheries altogether from the new ocean treaty. So if let's say through the provisions of the new treaty, an area of the ocean would be declared a protected area, the fishing industry is demanding that fishing activities of whatever nature can continue unaffected inside that protected area. I think it only takes uh, looking, for instance, at the Global Conservation Statute of Sharks, with 81 species listed as threatened, to realize that there are fundamental problems to fixing fisheries management, and that this is all about keeping power and influence to continue business as usual. Of course, there are many more, more examples. For instance, only two weeks ago, the Regional Fisheries Management Body in charge of managing fisheries in the Southeastern Pacific met in Ecuador, where it could not agree to stop bottom falling of the seamounts. Seamounts are underwater mountains that can rise one to 4,000 meters from the deep sea floor and host great, but also very vulnerable biodiversity. This includes fragile deep sea corals and other fauna. The seamounts, are considered as vulnerable marine ecosystems, which are destroyed when bottom falling nets are dragged across them. 
There are numerous resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly calling on states to protect these ecosystems, for instance, the Simons, and not authorize any bottom fishing that can damage them. Yet, there was no agreement at the meeting in Ecuador to prohibit bottom falling on Simons in the region. So yes, there are regulatory gaps, and we see again and again how fishing activities that are in breach of international obligations related to the protection of marine ecosystems, which are authorized under the existing legal framework. And well, I, I go to another example now, which uh, I think it has been mentioned already uh, by the Minister of Finland, which is uh, deep sea mining. And the problem is that something uh, similar is very likely to happen, and this activity may become the newest threat to global marine biodiversity. And I'm, I'm talking about deep sea mining in the international areas of the world's oceans. For those who haven't heard of it, the global, demand, the global demand for minerals, which is partly expected to grow as a result of the transition to green energy and transport systems, is now being used as a justification to start commercial mining operations in the deep ocean, three, four kilometers beneath the surface. Without getting into detail, one of the most notable examples is what, what are called polymetallic nodules. And these are dark potato-shaped nodules that have been formed over the course of millions of years in the vast and deep abyssal plains of the world's oceans. These nodules are rich in manganese, nickel, cobalt, and other metals, which are, for instance, demanded in batteries that are expected to uh, be very much needed for the energy transition. But mining uh, these nodules will come at a huge cost to marine ecosystems. Scientists are warning that it's not possible to mine these ecosystems without irreversible biodiversity law. And here we're talking about extinctions, potentially of species that haven't even been identified yet by scientists. Every time there's a deep ocean research expedition, new species are discovered, species which have evolved completely, isolated from other regions and could be lost forever. There are far too many unknowns about deep sea ecosystems. We know the deep ocean holds amazing biodiversity, yet it is very vulnerable. We know it's one of the largest carbon sinks on the planet, which mining operations could impact. To give an idea of the scale uh, of the activity we're talking about, the area of seafloor habitat impacted to mine nodules in the Pacific alone would be of some 1.5 million square kilometers which is more or less the combined area of Spain, Portugal, France, Belgium, and Germany. Legally speaking, the law of the sea mandates all states to effectively protect the marine environment from harmful effects. Yet at the same time, the law of the sea regime created an international body, the International Seabed Authority, which is charged with managing the extraction of minerals from the deep sea, and its structure and mandate is such that it makes it very difficult to prevent mining in favor of ecosystem conservation. Something which I think is also remarkable from the legal point of view is that the mineral resources that would be exploited in international waters are considered to be common heritage of humankind, meaning that they, would, they should only be exploited if, if their extraction benefits humankind as a whole. Leaving aside that looking at profits from mining would ignore the many benefits that the conservation of the deep ocean provides to the planet, we are seeing yet again a handful of corporations based in the global north as the one that stand to benefit from this rush to mine the deep ocean. Going back to my initial point, which was about the way in which some of these industries and sectoral bodies are trying to prevent that the new ocean treaty has excessive influence over their current status quo, the International Seabed Authority Secretary General is also this week in New York. And he's saying that his mandate already includes taking measures for the protection of the marine environment as a whole. And that, I quote, it is essential that in the haste to seek to manage particular components of the marine environment, we fully respect the rights and jurisdictions carefully elaborated by the law of the sea. And the way I translate this is, we don't want the new treaty to interfere with deep sea mining act activities. Currently, the NGO community working in oceans conservation is campaigning strongly to stop mining activities in the deep ocean before commercial mining actually starts. But there is a very strong inst institutional architecture and legal framework, which is designed to facilitate mining. I'll finish saying that, of course, we are hoping to the strongest, for the strongest possible ocean treaty out of New York this week. And with a couple of comments linking what I just said with the subject of this seminar, Ecoside. First, that 
as I said, I'm no legal expert, uh, but in looking at the definition of ecocide being put forward by the independent expert panel, I would believe some that some fishing activities and certainly deep sea mining would fit the definition of wanton acts, as well as severe, widespread, and long-term damage. And secondly, I try to show how the existing legal, legal regime is not managing to prevent activities that cause or would cause serious harm to the marine environment. But ecocide law could add to the tools we have to try to prevent further damage to the world's marine ecosystems, as well as their recovery, and can become an enforceable and international criminal law deterrent to prevent damage caused by these activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, I thank you for sharing that information on seamounts and the deep sea mining of nodules. I, I knew about the nodules, but I did not know so much about seamounts. So that is, you know, thank you for exposing the regulatory gaps that are in effect authorizing this horrific act of ecocide to happen. So let's let's move to a different perspective now. So the the move to criminalize ecocide has many indigenous voices behind, it, including worldwide networks of traditional leaders and chiefs. And the Alliance of Mother's Nature's Guardians called for the recognition of ecocide in this declaration at the time of the Paris Agreement in 2015. The Mother Earth delegation of the United Original Nations added more voices in 2020. Indigenous input was specifically included in the drafting process for the legal definition. And Chief, recently, Chief Raoni of the Cayapo in Brazil Reiterated, reiterated a strong call for ecocide law to protect the Amazon. So our next speakers, Mike and Hineka Mako, are renowned Maori activists and development leaders from, from New Zealand. And from, I, I always mispronounce it, so you're going to have to pronounce the, the correct pronunciation of New Zealand for me. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Is Countries to have, and I'm so embarrassed about that, but every single time, every single time. It's one of the small handful of countries that have notable indigenous representation in politics. The government also recently became a founding member of the Wellbeing Economy and Government Initiative with a view to shifting the focus of economic activity from GDP to metrics of human and ecological well-being. And I love that. I love that. And looking at the global biodiversity framework that emerged from COP15 in Montreal, it seems that the political world's at last, at last beginning to awake to the fundamental importance of indigenous knowledge and practice and establishing the healthy relationship of human beings with the living world. So your work seems to be about bridge building in this context. Can you tell us more about what you do, about the Maori perspective, how it relates to laws protecting nature, and how recognition of ecocide might align with or support it. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, and um, greetings to everybody that's on this uh, webinar today. And thanks to um, to Stop Ecocide now for arranging this and giving us a platform to give our perspectives. So um, yes, my name is Mike, and this is uh, Henny Carr sitting alongside me. We're going to split our presentation in two. Uh, I'd just like to start by um, acknowledging the previous speakers, and I can all, you know, already see the alignments um, and the various perspectives that have been given uh, so far today. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge Belcour Carl Thomas um, from Vanuatu's call to action. Um, it definitely is time to take action. Um, we thank Vanuatu for taking the initiative to the ICC and, um, you know, our thoughts are with the people of uh, those islands, the island of Vanuatu and Tana and the other outlying islands that are currently experiencing the uh, Category 4 cyclone. We've just come through a cyclonic event um, within the last week or so and uh, many of our villages have been destroyed down the east coast of um, our country. Uh, some of the um, largest uh, largest cities have been decimated. There are People are homeless at the moment and are living in evacuation shelters. Uh, there's been a lot of economic da damage. And this has been the greatest uh, rain um, rain event that we've ever seen in our recorded history. Uh, and so um, climate change is real and it's, uh, and it's happening to us all uh, here at the bottom of the Pacific. Um, the cyclone, cyclones are generated up around Vanuatu in the South Coral Sea due to the warming of the water, as we'd be aware, which powers the winds which generates the cyclones that sweep across the islands of the Pacific. 
So um, these are, you know, and we're all, all of our countries are experiencing uh, various extreme weather events. So, so we join with you in solidarity to, um, you know, to struggle against the, uh, the extractive industries that are at the root of this problem. But however, back to your question in terms of the Māori worldview, um, I'm going to show you a quick video that we've put together, which um, explains our, um, our our view on the world and where we sit within it. So I'm just going to share my screen with you now and play this. image that you see there is um, our territory, which is the Pacific Ocean. It's the largest um, uh, environment or biosphere in the, on the planet. It's bigger than all the land masses. Um, if you were to join all the continents together, you could drop them into the Pacific Ocean. So it's a substantial um, ecosphere, and it's um, the territory which um, supports our people and the wider Polynesian uh, family. So um, when it's referred to uh, as the you know, international space or the international oceans, what it fails to recognise is that um, these are the actual territories of um, of oceanic people. Whom, um, and funnily enough, we're probably one of the biggest imperial um, uh, countries in the world. Well, not, when I say imperial, so like from a geographical point of view, like we're a huge um, geographical space. Um, and yet most of that is water, but um, our people's history is one of um, ocean voyaging uh, and travelling backwards and forwards between the little specks of land that we'd live our lives on, but the um, but we would consider the ocean as, as part of our territory. So deep deep concerns about um, about what's happening in that space. So from that video, you would have seen the um, that's where the sacred lives. Uh, in those images and, and in those words, those chants that you heard uh, that describe the creation of the earth through all the stages that we tried to represent visually to give you an idea of what the words are saying. And so it charts the, um, the you know, the formation of the um, universe uh, through to the um, coming of light. Uh, you saw the planets forming. Uh, you saw life evolving on our particular planet, uh, uh, leading down to uh, our own species evolving and um, occupying those very all the niches and all the places on the face of the earth. And so that's for us where the first um, um, body of law exists, and it's the law of nature, it's the sacred law, that's the overarching law that controls uh, all of our human behavior it must sit within that realm. Um, the, we call that mana atua, it's the highest form of, um, of law. Uh, the second level is um, us, the people, and as you saw how that evolutionary process um, has come down to us as people, and we've form formulated our own laws, our laws to um, to govern our behaviours amongst ourselves and our relationship to the things around us. Uh, however, all of that must be um, uh, must be um, subservient to the law of nature. Uh, and in our worldview, um, the next layer or the next tier of jurisdiction is the uh, use of resources. 
in what we call uh, mana whenua. And so it's about how allocation and use of resources um, is distributed, but that's got that's subject to the, the level above it, which is the law of um, you know, the law of that humans create, which is where we discuss things like equity, um, like you know, um, correct use of uh, various resources, etc., in accordance once again with the highest form of law, the law of the laws of nature. Um, and so that's the matrix, if you like, for us. Unfortunately, the Western uh, concepts have inverted that. And so you have the the law of uh, economics as being one of the major drivers, you know, in this um, uh, current extractive economy that all of us are suffering from. So it's the law of, and Jojo uh, just described that quite eloquently in her talk, how the um, the laws of um, the the economic um, drivers um, put a lot of pressure on the political um, legal uh, system or the governance systems that we've created for ourselves. And the, the relationship to the sacred, which is the highest level for us, well, what's happened to that? And as we all know, that's just been somewhat pushed out and uh, marginalized and ignored. And so the relationship that we have um, in the building bridges, I don't know if we're trying to build bridges. I think we're trying to uh, flip the script, you know, and um, we are working towards the restoration of what we believe is a universal human uh, framework. And that when we look at other indigenous peoples and we meet with them from time to time, we share this commonality. We look at the peoples of Europe, and if you go back far enough in their histories beyond um, imperialism um, and um, and nation states back to the origins of the, of the peoples of the world, you will find these um, these sentiments exist. It seems to be a universal truth that we somehow along the way we've lost. Uh, and so, yeah, so we're trying to um, invert that framework. But I'm now going to um, pass over to uh, Henika, and she's going to uh, take the conversation a bit further. So thank you. Pacific greetings to everybody. It is very early morning here on the 3rd of the 3rd, um, a significant day for the call for global climate action. So support what Mike said in support of everybody taking action to protect our world. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to read my notes because it's quite a, a broad uh, area to, to, to cover um, uh, to answer the question that you raised about Māori perspectives and how it relates to the laws protecting nature. I just wanted to introduce myself properly. So Henika Mako, my family name is Mako. Uh, it's my grandfather's name, uh, our family, which is from Te Mako. This is the, the shark. And this name reminds us of our relationship to the ocean, to the moana. And as a family, we are bound to that memory uh, in our name and our relationship recognition of the great ocean of Kiwa, another name for the Pacific Ocean, uh, where our voyaging fleets full of Pacific Island ancestors sail back and forth to Aotearoa. Aotearoa is uh, translated as land of the long white cloud. Um, the ao is one of our words for cloud. And it's that low cloud that sits directly above islands and is generated by the moisture rising and the energy off the land. That reflection uh, of the sunlight back down onto the land and coastlines effectively bathe islands in a glowing light. So I would like to describe Aotearoa as meaning or as long as the translation should be land of the long cloud of glowing light. Um, and celebrating Māori names of what we call ourselves, what's reflected in our art and our cultural references and philosophical frameworks that reflects that orientation within our world and our connection to our environment in a family way, in a familial way. We all introduce ourselves, many of us, um, to our tribal homelands and we recall the waka, the ancient voyaging vessels that came to Aotearoa from the Pacific Islands. Um, we name the, the waka, we name our ancestral mountains and we name our rivers. So for me, for example, Aotea is my waka, Bebe is my mountain, Wanu is my awa. Um, so awa river, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> so uh, my grandmother's family name was Takarangi. My grandmother's mother lies in the family burial ground next to our marae, our traditional meeting grounds in front of the carved ancestral meeting houses. There's a preschool, a primary school behind the marae and many houses in our community that live right beside the ancestral river of Wanganui, near to the river mouth, which is threatened by the flooding, the storm surges and rising sea levels. Uh, I will speak briefly about the legal personhood precedent of the Wanganui River in relation to the question how Māori perspectives relate to laws uh, in terms of protecting nature. Um, 
with special note chat, the heart of that matter is how and the recognition of law is seeing our value systems and our natural laws which bind us as people to our environment. Before I do, I want to share a little bit about what takarangi means. So Mike's got an image there. Uh, that is the takarangi uh, intersecting double spiral pattern, signifies humanity celestial origins, as we saw in the video earlier at the beginning of the universe that is at the center in the shape. Um, we saw the galaxy spinning into being, and it is reflected uh, in the carving on the prows of our waka that literally guide us on every voyage. Um, this double spiral has the spaces in between the solid parts that allows us to see the spirals. And it symbolizes the two spirals, Rangi Nui and Papatsu Anuku, our sky father and earth mother. The open space between them connects them as an indivisible whole, it symbolizes Tao Marma, the world of light and knowledge. There's that word again, Al, the clouds. Uh, essentially, it's our atmosphere. So this concept of an indivisible whole is embedded in Tawatupua, that's the framework which underpins the legal personhood of Wanganui, the, the Awa and our people of Wanganui. It represents a move towards restorative justice and sustainable practices for healthy waters. So for more than a century, the laws, the regulations and actions of the justice system of the, the, the Crown government here broke our river into parts. Dawa Tsupua ensures that the waterways which all join together, the creeks, the, the small uh, tributaries and in every part of the waters that join to become the Honganui River that flows from the mountains to the seas and to the oceans is viewed and managed not in isolation but with reference to the whole river as the interconnected ecosystem. To Honganui people, our river is a living being, an indivisible whole, all the tributaries as I mentioned, and the physical and metaphysical elements that bind us. Dawatupu recognizes the set of indigenous values that reflect an innate relationship of the river and the people, and the people as guardians and protectors of the river. Uh, quite famous now across our lands is the phrase, I'm the river, the river is me. That's been extended out to, I am the mountain, the mountain is me. I am Aotearoa, Aotearoa is me. But the whole phrase starts with, Kinga Maunga Kitangaroa, that the river flows constantly from the mountains to the sea. And therefore, I am the river, the river is me. I'm going to ask now for Mike to weave together the threads of our presentation to you um, with regards to how the recognition of Ecoside might align with or support our work. Thank you, uh, Henika, and uh, thanks to everybody uh, for once again giving us this opportunity to speak to you about uh, our perspectives. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, uh, already I can see the alignments philosophically uh, in terms of our understanding of our place within nature and um, the uh, the need to defend it at this time. Um, this is not an abstract thing, That this is not a lifestyle choice. Uh, it's a choice about um, getting away from the culture of death which we have developed um, around us and we are now reaping the rewards of and returning uh, into that world of light that Henneka describes where we live with balance uh, with our fellow creatures and um, that we understand that our interests as humans are inextricably bound uh, to their well-being as well. So um, thanks very much for being the good people that you are and for pursuing this um, this um, struggle. As Henneka said, today is the 3rd of March over here, so we've got the... Um, climate strike so we leave this uh, webinar and we go onto the streets with uh, with our young people to um to demonstrate um you know uh, our opposition to the extractive economy and, and the policies that support that so thank you very much i want to say also thank you thank you for creating the mechanisms which can enforce um our world perspectives in our environment um and our protection of it thank you That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Henneke. That video was powerful. Thank you for sharing what I felt was actually quite deeply spiritual experience looking at that. And thank you, Henneke, for elaborating how the beautiful relationship between the river and the sea, the river and the people is seen as understood and felt and lived. I'm the river, the river is me. I'm at Aotearoa, Aotearoa is me. <laughs> Worst, I'm the worst at pronouncing this. Thank you for your patience with me. I just wanted to say how much I appreciated that. And thank you, Stop e Ecoside, for making this reality possible.
So I just wanted to move on to existing legal obligations to protect the ocean. Anna von Riebe founded law firm Ocean Vision Legal to focus on ocean litigation. In other words, legal actions to enforce marine protection in courts. The firm also concerns at the interface of marine protection and climate change. Climate litigation is a fast growing phenomenon around the world and OVL is specializing in ocean related work in that area. In Terlaya, OVL's work includes actions before international courts and tribunals, national actions and company liability litigation, consultation, mediation, and education. Anna herself wrote her PhD on the obligations of states to protect the marine environment and, spe and specializes in legal pathways to hold states liable to comply with this obligation. Anna, please tell us more about this work and how you can see ecocide law interacting with this broadening litigation landscape. Thank you, Caroline, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for all the speakers so far for these insights. Once again, it's such a humbling experience also to understand how the law can maybe give a framework, but the real content is the nature and what we really need to remember is our connection and our connection to the nature. Well, I was asked to contribute to this um, workshop from the legal perspective though. So when thinking about it, I asked myself, what does ecocide mean to me as a lawyer, as a lawyer who founded a law firm for um, marine protection? What does ecocide mean for me in, that, uh, in this regard? Well, ecocide is the willful damaging of the, marine, of the environment. And with regard to the marine environment, this can take many forms. Depleting the oceans through overfishing, as we heard from Sebastian. Bulldozing coral reefs with bottom trawls. Killing marine mammals. Releasing toxic discharge when mining for minerals on the seabed. You name it, there are so many issues. So how does ecocide connect with my work for ocean litigation? Well, as a background for how ocean litigation came into being, um, it was when I was looking at climate litigation and imagine climate litigation as a picture. Imagine this fresh wind blowing around the world. It's promising. It's holding the possibility for everyone, for you and for me, to finally have a seat at the table that is usually occupied by politicians. So young people all around the world started going on the street. They actually started suing the states for breaching their climate obligations. So I asked myself, why do we not have that for the ocean yet? And this is why I founded Ocean Vision Legal, to create this way to create a tsunami that like the fresh wind of climate litigation can go around the world and motivate people to really take action to protect the marine environment. A wave of ocean litigation. And it was in this slide that um, I set out to write my doctorate thesis on the obligation to, um, of states to protect, the, to protect and preserve the marine environment. And having had a lot of experience in litigation before, I structured the whole work as a case to really then be able to later use it to manifest this obligation in courts. So the obligation to protect the marine environment, like the ocean, is not secluded. It's an ecosystem. It connects with many other branches of law. We've just heard from Mike about the rights of nature, and we will be hearing about it more, um, or a human right to clean and healthy environment, or ecocide. So ecocide is a willful damaging of the environment. And the Stop Ecocide movement aims to get ecocide recognized as the fifth crime under the Rome Statute, so it gets prosecutable before the International Criminal Court. The four other crimes that are recognized under the Rome Statute so far, from a legal perspective, have one thing in common. They are all peremptory norms of international law. Peremptory norms of international law are laws from which no derogation is allowed. They are also called use codes. 
they are the highest protected laws that we have in international law because states are bound by them and they are not allowed to derogate them. So strengthening the obligation to protect the marine environment as a U.S. Kogan's regulation is a first step and it can be a prerequisite for ecocide to be acknowledged as a crime under the Rome Statute. So the obligation to protect the marine environment and ecocide are very closely related. Furthermore, looking at that from a perspective as the litigation lawyers, Recognizing ecocide brings so many benefits. In international law, for example, only states can be sued. International law regulates the relationship between states, so only states can be sued. Before the International Criminal Court, however, also individuals can be prosecuted if, when it gets recognized, they willfully harm the environment. So when thinking of all the veilers out there and you know all the people harming the environment, this can make such a difference. Furthermore, in, um, in, in the, under the Rome Statute, penalties are possible. Or um, another benefit is that in international law, we always need a state suing another state, which states hesitate to do because they don't want to th um, threaten their political relationships. In um, the International Criminal Court, we have a prosecutor who prosecutes the crime. So there are so many benefits for um, ecocide and the stop ecocide movement to get ecocide recognized as a criminal law for litigating all these cases. The work that we do on the cases um, in Ocean Vision Legal um, are all dedicated to strengthen the obligation to protect the marine environment. Of course, I cannot get into too much detail because there are all pending cases at the moment, um, but what we are really looking at is the obligation to protect the marine environment, rights of nature, which my colleague Michelle Bender is going to talk on more, the human right to healthy environment, and with specific, specific focus on deep sea bottom trawling and um, deep sea mining. So. When taking a breath and looking at that and looking at 2023, the third year of the ocean decade, to me, this year really holds the potential for this wave of ocean litigation to take off. And I really couldn't be more excited to support the Stop Ecocide movement through my work and really help, help it to take off. And so thank you, Jojo, for this initiative and thank you everyone for participating in this really important movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And, you know, this is such a, this is such an important area. And it's fantastic that we have women, beautiful, elegant, brilliant women. And I'm just a little bit biased, and I'm going to say that myself, at the helm of this climate litigation. And I just love what you're doing. Anna. It's powerful work. So I just wanted to thank you and Ocean Vision Legal for your, I got that right, making sure, Ocean Vision Legal, for your powerful, powerful contribution. And what I can't imagine what's going to happen when Ecoside actually becomes law, you're just going to take off. So we now come to Dana Ahmed, youth spokesperson, take off even more than you are taking off right now, I should say. We now come to Dana Ahmed, youth spokesperson and Arctic Angel, committed to protecting our global commons as part of a female-led intergenerational network coordinated by the NGO Global Choices. The Arctic Angels have a particular focus on the ice crisis, the rapid melting on the polar ice caps. Dana is a law and politics student and a passionate climate and ocean advocate with in-depth policy development experience, including as Egypt's contact point in the STG7 constituency group, membership of the Yungo Oceans Voice Working Group, and an outreach officer at the MENA Youth Network. She was the youngest and only Arab member of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance Youth Policy Advisory Council of 2022. Her passion to support neurodivergent youth led her to founding EcoSpectrum, the first app aiming to elevate inclusivity of youth within the spectrum of autism in climate action and ocean conservation. 
Dejna, can you tell us more about the importance of ocean conservation from the perspective of the upcoming generation and the importance of ecocide law within that picture? Thanks so much, over to you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, just before I begin, I thought I would just give a little brief on Arctic Angels. It's an amazing organization. We are composed of 53 young climate leaders, women climate leaders from 32 countries and counting, um, located all around the world. The Arctic Angels is a safe space of support and encouragement and a network of networks connecting broad youth movements from Fridays to Future, uh, Fridays for Future to Climate Cardinals to Ecospectrum. Um, we illuminate the intersectionality and interdependence of climate systems by describing how the sea ice decline affects our communities from Greenland to the Philippines to Egypt. They elevate, we elevate the marginalized voices advocating on behalf of those who will feel the greatest effects of the melting poles. Now, starting with the role of the youth in this crisis. The youth has now been the driving force in climate action for the past decade, uh, working with the most vulnerable communities that include our own to help save ours, our children, and our home's future. From working tirelessly, organizing, and taking part in protests, to instituting research bodies that study the primary sources of the ocean and ice crisis that ultimately robs us from pursuing our cultural practices that rely on protecting our oceans and protecting the Arctic ice shield. Currently, the youth working on our oceans are concerned with the biggest threat, or arguably the biggest threat, our oceans are facing today, which is deep seabed mining. And for nation states to listen to our concerns and science-backed research on the need for moratoriums on the Arctic ice shield that regulates our weather and the balance of temperatures of our oceans that is required for the marine ecosystems that my livelihood and my family's livelihood and I'm sure many livelihoods rely on. Um, and yet those people that are the most impacted are still not granted the sphere to communicate our shared struggles. Speaking as an Egyptian woman, a state uh, that is currently one of the countries that produces the most single-use plastic in the world with an estimate of 12 billion unrecyclable single-use plastic waste released into our oceans, affecting our food and water sources. Our, we our weather, which our Nile and Red Sea is regulating, has now affected children going to schools, agricultural land that feeds most of our civilians, but now most of it has become infertile and thus urging the most underprivileged communities to abandon their homes amongst all the other struggles that they are going through just to be able to feed their families. And our, and our continuing economic fall that is now making our ability to recover from the most catastrophic impacts of climate change, which we deal with as a global South country, financially paralyzed. Yet, we have bodies that control states' regulations on our Arctic ice shield and ocean crisis, pushing, continuing to, to push away the voices of the most affected. But most knowledgeable communities from communicating solutions that our ancestors lived and survived on, that we currently are pushing away. What is currently happening in my region, the Middle East, is the continuous urbanization and growth of unsustainable forms of trade and transportation via our seas. Our precious seas and oceans are at risk. The Red Sea, which is our most crucial bodies of water, is now unfortunately releasing 220,000 tons of naturally occurring hydrocarbon gases annually. Youth has been the driving force of climate action for the past five years. And yet we have now become the community that is losing hope and unable to contribute to the uh, regulations that are put in place that do not address our shared struggles. We have been pushed to the side in the ocean sphere, especially in the biggest issues, which is deep sea bed mining and the ice crisis that have the most catastrophic impacts on our livelihoods and future. 
And yet in the coming decades, ship traffic through the Red Sea and through other ocean bodies and the Suez Canal that the, that the economy of Egyptian uh, authorities rely on is expected to continue to increase strongly with a commitment rise in nitrogen oxide emissions, which the increase will amplify the role of this source, leading to significant deterioration of the regional air quality across the globe, not just in Egypt. The ISA, as the guardian of the area and its resources, should never lose sight of the fact that the resources of the seabed has explicitly been designed by UNCLOS as the common heritage of humankind. The principle of common heritage of, hu of mankind stipulates that the area and its resources can only be used for peaceful purposes, but that is not the case. It cannot be appropriated by a state or any other entity and the exploration of the area and its resources that must benefit all of humankind. The concept of humankind invokes intergenerational solidarity, meaning that the benefits of managing the seabed and its resources should be felt by both the present generations and those still to come. As of now, SDG 14, which is life below water, is the least funded SDG. And our Arctic crisis is almost unheard in my region, despite its catastrophic and irreversible impact that will have on our future. Amidst the chaos of understanding the systems that control such detrimental processes, which are supported by many governments in my region, the youth has not stopped being the piggy bank in this conversation. We have ceased to become those that do not understand the language spoken by our executive bodies, such as the ISA or national jurisdictions. We cannot take up that role anymore. We know, we hear, we understand, we bear the consequences, but have no choice but to continue doing so amidst the loss of our youth years, futures, and childhood. To date, 653 marine science and policy experts from over 44 countries have signed the marine expert statement calling for a pause to deep sea mining. Support for deep sea mining directly contradicts a global trend towards preserving and restoring biodiversity and combating the climate crisis. We need the 10-year moratorium on the Central Arctic Ocean Ice Shield, which would work in tandem with ecocide law to ensure protection of the Arctic sea ice. Less than 5% of the deep sea has been discovered, and the youth will not be standing on the side, aiding the irreversible damage that may potentially pass via regulatory bodies that will kill the world of our ancestors in their decade living homes. There is no other option. We also need greater facilitation and engagement of all stakeholders at the ISA, including civil society, with an emphasis on intergenerational engagement through improving transparency and communication and through the following recommendations. Implement more public consultation mechanisms, create an independent environmental commission to formalize the criteria for adequate base, baseline data, as well as standards for sampling methodology. Share the standardized data with the global community and making it available to the public and decision makers and not continuing to be behind closed doors. As a law student, I'm personally growing to learn every day about how ecocide law is the only option to resolve such issues. And as youth, because we have no voting or authoritative say in regulatory bodies, we will only continue doing what we are doing now, striking, protesting, educating, learning and unlearning, growing and risking our ability to live and enjoy our lives like our previous generations have done on our age, to implement action and drive ecocide law. A call to action now for me is for everyone watching this um, stream, I urge you to educate, raise awareness on your corner of people. It is very, very hard to, as, as someone who is a member of the youth, as an Egyptian woman with my country struggling and suffering so much, especially our most impacted communities, the underprivileged communities, such as the communities in Sohag and Said and Alexandria. It is so disheartening thinking that there is no way to save the world. It's too big. It's too complex. It's too hard. And we have no voice or we have no authoritative power into actually actioning any uh, any decisions or have any impact on our government. 
But the way to resolve this is to focus on your corner of people. Every single one of us in this call and beyond have the corner of people that we have influence and impact on. I urge you to learn to read and educate that corner of body that you have power and impact and influence on. And together, we can globally save our oceans, marine ecosystems, and Arctic life. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. That was just, that was beautiful. Thank you for those deeply incisive facts and vision and truth. It has been sobering hearing these facts from one so young, I have to admit. However, I feel, I feel hopeful, Dana, amidst this despair that there is a vibrant new generation that is pushing us forward, that is holding us to account. And the future is in great hands with people like Dana. So I just want to thank you. Let's make sure that the will we are giving her and her generation is a sound one. So we now come to consider a different aspect of the law in relation to the ocean, the sphere of ocean rights. The area of nature rights has been expanding massively over the recent years to the point when particular landscape features or ecosystems now have some form of their own rights in about 39 different jurisdictions around the world at the last count. But what of the ocean in this context? So we have with us the woman who has literally written the book on this topic. Michelle Bender is Ocean Campaigns Director at the Earth Law Center as well as founder and creator of the Ocean Rights Framework, spearheading an innovative and paradigm shifting solution to our ocean management challenges through a legal lens. Her Ocean Rights ebook is available on Amazon, and she's co authored chapter, chapters in United Nations, A Better World, and Sustainability and Rights of Nature. She's also an environmental law and policy ex specialist with expertise in ocean and wildlife law sea otter conservation, and marine mammal protection. She serves on the executive, executive committee, sorry, I have a bit of a flu, I'm sorry about that, executive committee for Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, and is now a legal counsel for Ocean Vision Legal. Michelle, can you tell us how the ocean rights framework is evolving and where you see the complementaries with ecocide law? The floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation to be part of this webinar and speak to you all today. Um, and of course, for all the amazing panelists, uh, how do I follow that? But <laughs> I just wanna uh, start by saying I'm joining you today from outside Seattle, Washington and the traditional lands and waters of the Coast Salish peoples. And I think like many of us who have turned into this webinar, I share, um, very similar feelings and why I'm interested in ecocide and alternative legal pathways and that's being becoming you know increasingly frustrated at the system that we're working within its limitations and just seeing firsthand how even with environmental law with these lofty objectives we're just not reaching them and so seven years ago I really got inspired by looking at alternative legal pathways um, and ways of knowing such as rights of nature and started to really delve into and explore what this framework might look like, but within the ocean policy seascape. And just to give a, a brief background and as introduced by Caroline, rights of nature is an emerging legal framework. It's now in over 20 or 30 countries in various shapes and forms from the local community level as resolutions or ordinances to the national level, such as a constitutional amendment as in the case of Ecuador. Uh, most recently last year at the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity's COP, uh, rights of nature was included for the first time in an international agreement. It was actually included multiple times within the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that was agreed and came out of that, that COP. But I want to note that out of the hundreds of laws, judicial decisions, et cetera, that less than 5% of these rights of nature examples are specific to the ocean or marine ecosystems or species. Uh, though, of course, nature as a whole and the rights of nature laws that, that are broader embody and are inclusive of all parts, including the ocean, 
this is why I began to really innovate around ocean rights, rights of the ocean to address this gap. And I started looking at the application of this approach first in the context of marine protected areas and, and really looking and being inspired by how rivers and national parks around the world are now designated as legal entities or legal persons, uh, such as the example of Te Awa Te Pua Act in Aotearoa that my fellow panelists introduced. So I began to really explore how this could look like uh, in the context of marine ecosystems. And speaking of our ocean, we actually worked with our partner, the Leatherback Project and the government of Panama to draft the newest national rights of nature law, which was signed by the president last year and just went into effect at the end of last month. And we are now focusing on implementation in the ocean space, working on a new marine reserve in the Pearl Islands and looking at how to respect the rights of sea turtles and reef inhabitants in the in marine ecosystems. And last year we launched an initiative with the Ocean Range, which has now gained the support of governments, including Cabo Verde, Monaco, Seychelles, and others to advance principles underpinning ocean rights through a universal declaration of ocean rights or similar. So rights of nature is very much like it sounds. It's a recognition of a right relationship with nature that humankind is a part of and not separate from the rest of the living environment. And we have our responsibilities on behalf of present and future generations to ensure that our activities does not affect uh, the ability for future generations to thrive. Another note and just realization within this framework is that human rights, human livelihood is dependent upon the realization of nature's rights because we cannot realize our rights. We cannot have our jobs, our food without a healthy environment to support that. And so within this framework, nature is now beginning to be seen as something as other than a resource, other than a pro, uh, an object for human benefit and utility as valued for itself with intrinsic worth. And rights of nature is not just a legal change in that sense. Uh, I wanna just speak you know, why rights? You know, simply put, rights are a statement of societal values. So what we think is owed more protection or has value that needs to be respected. And by recognizing nature has inherent rights purely for existing, we're able to start shifting those worldviews, those underlying values and ethics that create our legal governance and economic systems. We protect what we value. We've seen this time and time again, which is why I really feel like rights to nature is really a, a, a leader in a, in a solution to truly achieve systemic and transformative change. And I wanna just highlight one example of how this is looking like in practice as not only an application of ocean rights, but also just to show some similarities with Ecoside. And I mentioned Ecuador. Uh, in, in 2008, Ecuador amended their constitution to recognize the rights of nature and gave all citizens the right to defend and protect those rights, allowing full representation of nature and decision making and disputes. The constitution explicitly states that nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structures, functions, and evolutionary processes. Nature also has the right to be restored. And this is seen as separate from the obligation of states to compensate individuals and communities affected by environmental damage. So we're in Ecuador, we've seen actually over 30 court cases and being brought in the name of nature, and many of them have been successful. Uh, and I want to just highlight one. There have been quite a few that have been specific to the Galapagos Marine Reserve and the marine space, such as for mangrove ecosystems. And I want to just highlight one case from 2017, where a Chinese fishing vessel, so an international fishing fleet, was found to be in possession of over 6,000 sharks which are protected by Galapagos law. 
in and outside the Galapagos Marine Reserve. So a few points I wanna highlight from this judgment. Shark fishing was found to be against the interest of nature. The court recognized that it was the highest duty of the state of Ecuador to guarantee not only the effective enjoyment of human rights, but the rights of nature as well. And the court also noted that as a subject of rights, nature is not only afforded a higher standard of protection, but full reparation from damage done. So not only did the captain and crew, uh, they were given prison time and fined around uh, $6 million actually. Um, and I wanna just really stick to that $6 million uh, for a second, because this is another implementation mechanism that we're, we're starting to really see emerge within the rights of nature movement. And it's this shift towards the inclusion of the intrinsic value or the living value of nature and shifting away from our short-sighted economic benefit um, and how we go about cost-benefit analysis. So if you look at the average cost or yeah, what you might receive from selling shark fins and, and meat on the market is about $150 USD. And so if you multiply that by 6,000 sharks, you can see that if the court would have ruled in that you know, traditional outlook and that lens, the amount that they would have fined the crew and the captain would have been much less. But here they really took into account the living value of sharks and how fundamental a live shark is to a healthy ecosystem and to the local tourism of the Galapagos. So much more valuable. This case, it not only marked the first conviction of an environmental crime in the Galapagos, uh, but it set a precedent for prosecuting shark finning and other crimes against nature in Ecuador. So speaking in terms of similarities with, with Ecocide, I think this case really demonstrates what and how if Ecocide, Ecocide is recognized uh, in persecuting severe harm at the international level, what this might look like, but through a local and, and regional lens and context. Similar to to human rights and their recognition, you know, having a mechanism for persecuting nature's rights at, at the international level, especially in areas beyond national jurisdiction, to me is vital. Um, you know, one difference or question of, you know, how these two frameworks sort of might differ or align is, you know, what is that severe damage? You know, would this instance of the shark fishing case in the Galapagos be something that would be considered severe enough for ecocide. Um, and so in that sense, I do, I do certainly think that both are needed, both are complementary, um, where we can have sort of those, those two sides of the coin uh, with proactive implementation and helping to shift values and worldviews towards the, the international and criminal recognition. Um, and so I just want to just highlight that you know, rights of nature and ecocide, I think, are both starting to gain traction internationally because, because of this frustration we're, we're feeling. We're, we're realizing that an anthropocentric system is what has led to, fueled and legalized the current degradation and pollution. And so we cannot use that same system to address these crises. And so rights of nature and ecocide, I think are just two very powerful tools that are vital and necessary to really achieve a life in harmony with nature. So with that, thanks again for the opportunity to, to speak with you all today. Thank you for that, Michelle. Thank you for that perspective and that sense that law is evolving with respect to the living world. I'm, Reminded about what Jojo said earlier about the policy paper, flagging up to board of directors, board directors, what they need to be taking into account right now, both rights of nature and ecocide development, ecocide law developments. If we were, if we had to address the level of crisis in our oceans and ultimately that all of us face. So um, I just wanted to do a tiny bit of housekeeping. Um, 
the event recording will be made available on Stop Ecoside website and the YouTube channel. And we will also be sharing it with the 60,000 plus members of our mailing list. So just letting you know. Um, and I think Roman is sharing the, um, the mailing list, how the link to join the mailing list. So now we've heard from all of our panels here live with us today, but we have one very special contribution that we have saved till last. And that is a video message from the remarkable Sylvia Earl, who is by now something of a legend in her own lifetime. Sylvia is a marine biologist, an oceanographer, an explorer, an author, a lecturer, a co-founder of Mission Blue, which unites individuals and organizations around the globe to campaign for a worldwide network of marine protected area or hope spots. She has been a National Geographic Explorer in residence since 1998, and Sylvia was the first female chief scientist of the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and was named by the Time magazine as its first hero for the planet in 1998. She's part of the group Ocean Elders, dedicated to protecting the ocean and its wildlife. We are so privileged to have today to receive a short video message in support of today's theme, which we will play for you now. There is a real case to be made for recognizing ecocide in the International Criminal Court, right along with, with genocide. Both are, when you think about it, killing us, killing either directly or by really killing the environment. Killing is killing. And we have to recognize the loss of the ocean, the deep sea, the high seas, life in the ocean affects the lives, the, not just the livelihoods, but yeah. the life, our existence is on the line. That was amazing. Thank you so much. What a what a wealth of perspectives. I just want to ask everyone to put on your video right now. Um, uh, I also want to pass to um, to Jojo first before we before we put everybody on. Let me just pass to Jojo, um, and I'll I'll ask everybody. Jojo, are you here? <laughs> here we Yes, I am. Sorry, I didn't necessarily mean you just to pass to me. I think we should definitely all put our videos on. Um, but we have we have very little time left because um, we've just had some amazing um, contributions. So it might just be great for everybody to just think of maybe a 30 second um, kind of comment that they could make um, after that amazing uh, panels. I was hoping that we would have a bit longer, but it's absolutely fine. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Should I continue or, 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 or we can start? I just wanted to say, you know, that was such a wealth of perspectives in such a short period of time and clear indicators of where we're going and what ways of recognition that ecocide will be of service to ocean protection. So as Jojo said, just very few, very briefly, if we can turn on, you know, our cameras and invite a couple of minutes reflection from each of you before we close very, very, very short. And we've been tracking questions from the audience. So if there's something you really want to say, you know, this is the time. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Anna, go for it and then pass it on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I really want to say is that how touching and amazing it is to speak with people from all the different branches because Speaking from the law perspective, I understand the law is the framework, but the content, what we're really doing, it comes from the science, it's the nature out there. And so with working together, with providing these insights from scientists, from, from people who are connected to the nature, with providing that and for lawyers and into law that can really create a, a sharp sword to help save the environment and what you are doing, Jojo, and, and ecocide, is in my perspective, one of the sharpest swords, potential sharpest swords that we have there. And so therefore it's so important to get it out there. And thank you everyone for the cooperation and teamwork in that. And I wanna give it on, pass it on to Dana, please. 
Thank you. Um, I guess it, this is just a call for my generation. Um, again, this is my corner that I focus on. So this is a call for my generation. It is to rather not be afraid to lead, but also do not be afraid to work alongside people, to working together and learning from the people who you know might have more knowledge about a certain area than you do. It is not embarrassing. It is not a mistake to admit to the process of learning and unlearning. It is part of growth, it is part of development, and we are at a very critical stage in the climate, ocean, and ice crisis that requires us, unfortunately, to unlearn most of the practices that we used to do. Um, but yet it is very crucial, and it's a very crucial point of growth, and it is very crucial for us as a generation to start leading and guiding the future generations into taking uh, action and mitigating that action for, to actually uh, achieve the change that we all want to see eventually. And I will pass it on to Sebastian. Thank you, Dana. I will only say, uh, you know, that, um, yeah, sometimes uh, when you spend time campaigning on these issues, you can uh, uh, be a bit desperate about how you see progress the environmental crisis and how you see that over the years some of the problems are not solved but it is always inspiring and it gives hope to just see more and more different communities looking at different aspects coming together providing more tools for campaigning and yeah it's it's always really nice and I have to say Dana it's been really amazing to listen to you in particular and at the last meeting I attended of the uh, I attended the International Civil Authority for the same for the first time. This was the Assembly of October last year. There was representation from the youth, and it does make a difference to have uh, all these officials and institutions listening to people who are telling them, you know, this is not just about what we do today, but about what will be left tomorrow. And you really need to listen to our interests and our you know opinions, etc. So. Yeah, it's it's been you know it's it's really nice to uh, to listen to such a uh, wide range of panelists and um, perspectives. So thanks a lot for that, and I'll pass it on to Michelle. Thanks. I just want to kind of build off of what everyone has said so far, and just highlight that you know I can I can understand that eco side to some may sound scary, you know, it's sort of this legal framework that, you know, might seem too far out from what, you know, your specific skill sets or what you're working on is. But I think, you know, now is the time that we all have a role to play. Um, and I just wanna highlight that anyone can be a part of these, these transformative and systems-based movements, uh, regardless what your skill set is. And I really just want to like highlight what Dana said about unlearning some of these practices and knowledge, but also remembering and reconnecting. And that's something that we can all do is reconnect with nature and have those conversations and dialogues with everyone we know about how vital the ocean and a healthy planet is to all of our lives. So thank you. Oh, I'm passing it on. Uh, so who's left? Is Mike still on? Mike and Hinaka, are you still there? Maybe not, maybe they're not able to, to join us for a final comment. Um, in which case, I'll just say a couple of things that really sort of resonated with me, if that's all right. Um, Firstly, re yeah, really touched by Dana's call for, you know, concrete action in the communities that we can reach. Um, and also really, um, really feeling what Hinaka was um, talking about in terms of the belonging to the land and the, and also the way that her, she described her family names and about how they related to the, to the landscape and to the sea. Um, and I think one of the things that we, and, and this also relates to what Michelle was saying about how we value you know, we, we protect what we value. Um, and I think in our sort of Western paradigm dominated way of thinking, we've got so used to traveling around so fast and every, lots of urbanization that a lot of us don't have a landscape that we feel actually deeply rooted in and deeply care about. 
Um, so that's one of the relearnings that I'd really like to see is people actually finding where it is they do feel rooted and caring about that. Um, and that also speaks to the kind of, um, actually there was a, a question that came into the, the Q&A around, you know, what about the resistance of kind of, you know, economic interests that are sort of in the dark and, you know, getting on with their machinations and don't want decoside law. Um, and yes, there may be, of course, um, some of those, but I think um, what's really interesting is that they're not coming out publicly because we're in such a position now globally that there's a comprehension of the crisis that we're in that nobody's going to publicly come out against this because it would be the most dreadful public relations imaginable. Um, you know, when you've spent 20 years greenwashing as an oil and gas company, the last thing you're going to do is publicly say, no, we don't want decoside law. Now, what that means is that the talking to our communities the creation of this community of oceans for ecocide law is super important because the more public and the more widespread this conversation is, the harder it is to resist. We're already in a position where governments are too embarrassed if they don't want to support ecocide to say so outright. They might try and sidestep, but uh, you know we're already at that point. And so that really underlines the importance of what we're doing here with beginning this Oceans for Ecocide Law Network. You know, this is not something that competes with what we're each doing. It supports what we're all doing. Um, it's an and and, <laughs> not an and all. Um, so yeah, so encouraging everybody in the ocean space to come on board, to join the Ecocide, Ocean for Ecocide Law Network um, and to talk about ecocide because when that conversation is broad and loud enough, that's when all politicians feel safe to talk about it um, and to move it forward. So yeah, really, Really encourage all of you to do that. There's also an open letter that, that can be signed from you know, people who are working with ocean and ocean conservation. And thanks to everybody for got a really remarkably eye-opening and amazing event. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Caroline, for moderating. Uh, if I may, I just wanted to say um, about from my work, my perspective, I didn't and it's just two seconds I wanted to say defending indigenous and environmental defenders, amplifying their voices at the UN level and also through climate and environmental justice litigation. This is amazing. This is amazing that the world is going this way. We started our thing about three years ago with the Institute for Small Islands. We had to be really quiet about it because previously when we had done work like this, we were threatened. We were cursed when we approached mining and quarrying and regulated quarrying in my country. Somebody followed my colleague home. It's real on the side. And this is an area where, you know, it's not like the Amazon. This is what you're doing for the world is amazing. I just want to thank you, Stop Ecoside and Jojo and Sarah, for the work that you're doing. So bravo to you. And thank you to Mike and Hineka, sorry, Anna and Dana and Dana and Michelle and Sebastian for your fantastic, fantastic work on, um, on everything that you're doing for coming here today, taking time out of your busy schedules and sharing with us, you know, where the world is going on this, on this eco side path. So thank you very much. Jojo, I didn't mean to cut you in there, but I just wanted to say that before you wrapped up. Thank you. Thanks to all of our audience. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us.